good morning to each of you um, for being with me this morning to do Psalm 14. You know, when I think of the Psalms, there's a contemporary term for young people that's called playlists. Young people put together their favorite songs and that they call their playlist. And this is the Jewish people's playlist of 150 favorite songs to God. And when I read these psalms closely, which I do with you, um, when I read them, I'm always asking myself, what's distinctive about this psalm? Why is it included on the playlist of the 150? And so far, what has delighted me is the awareness that each of the psalms has had a different perspective. Though I will note that this particular psalm this morning, Psalm 14, has a parallel in Psalm 53, which we'll get to if we keep going, and I hope to keep going, down the line. And Psalm 53 will be nuanced only in two ways differently. In that sense, we'll revisit why is this psalm distinctive. But Psalm 14 is distinctive, and I'll tell you up front what I see as distinctive about this psalm. Unlike the other psalms, which are often, think of yesterday, Psalm 13, how much longer, words of despair emerging from pain of the psalmist, this one does not reveal the pain of the psalmist. This is a psalm that, as I read it, is from the perspective of heaven, from the 30,000 view foot point of view, looking down at the world. Though I will share that I'm pleased that the translation that I have created for today is a bit different than the other translations, and I'll point out the difference. But before I get there, let me remind us of the difficulty of translation in Hebrew. There's three key challenges. One is the tense. Remember, in Hebrew, there's just perfect and imperfect. Perfect is past to present. Imperfect is present to future. So you never know, is this about the past or the present, the present or the future? Problem one is, what's the tense? Problem number two is, poetry by its nature is often the use of rare words that are ambiguous. not straightforward. And third, there are no capital pronouns in Hebrew. So when it says you, as we'll see here as a key word, will be my, you don't know if the my is God talking with a capital M, or is it the Psalter with a small m, which you'll see in verse four when we get to it. So you don't know in translating who is speaking, or at least it's ambiguous. So I'll pull that in. Translation is interpretation. And every translation I have, as I use to prepare, is nuanced differently. This psalm I entitled, They Would Eat Up My People Like Bread. It's a line in the psalm, and somehow this metaphor grabbed me. Let me first read it in English. I'll go back and then point out some of the choices of words for the Psalter that are revealing. And like yesterday, I hope to leave the last 10 minutes for your reactions. I gained so much from comments yesterday and I know I will today. So the translation of a Psalm that's seven verses. For the conductor for David, the scoundrel says internally, there is no God. Let us act corruptly. Let us perform loathsome deeds. There is no one who does good. Adonai from heaven scopes out humanity to see whether is, there is any person of understanding, a seeker after God. They are all astray, altogether foul. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do they understand anything? Evildoers who would eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on Adonai. 
there they will be terribly terrified, for God is with the righteous generation. You may put to shame the counsel of the poor, but Adonai is a refuge. Oh, from Zion may Israel deliverance come. When Adonai restores the nation's tranquility, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. So you may note, I already made a change just moments before in verse 4. Instead of doing this, do they not understand all those evildoers? I changed here at the last moment to do not do they not understand anything? Hallo, which is aim lo, hallo yadu kol. Do they not understand anything? Dash evil doers who would eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call an Adonai. And this for me was the most mm, revealing part of this translation. Verse four is that a capital M or a small m? I will add, in almost all translations that I looked at, it's a small m, meaning it's the Psalter talking about his people, or her people. But in the Mitsuda translation, which is the little pocket book that I like so much, um, there it's a capital M. I'm going to hold up my little Mitsuda. I like it because I've used it for years. It's a you know, linear translation, line by line, and it tries to be true to a more literal reading. And they do it with a capital, which then opened up the following way of reading this psalm, that it's God who is speaking. And what the psalmist is doing is imagining how God sees God's world. And I love that because it makes it a different kind of perspective, a different kind of psalm. So let me break it down now structurally. But let me point out one thing before I kind of break down the three components of this psalm, how it's broken down. And that is the use of God's name. There are two different um, words used for God's name. One is Elohim. You'll see Elohim in, as God in which I translate as God in contrast to Adonai, where I say Adonai. So in verses one, two, and five, the word for God is Elohim. Elohim is the job description. Authority, powerful one. In the Bible, Elohim is used also for people like judges. Elohim is authority. In contrast to the yud heh vav -Hey, which I call Adonai, which is the intimate relational God. And so there, this psalm is in three parts. It's verse 1, but only... Well, actually, I changed that. I have a different way of understanding it. Because I also chose to often, verse 1, the quote... It often stops, and I, I had taken off, actually, this quote. You see, in verse 1, there is no, this is God. The, the scoundrel says internally, there is no God. Let us act corruptly, let us perform loathsome deeds. There's no one who does good. And then I have, quote, that's how most people have the quote. But I, you, you um, have the quote later. Um, no, I, I, I take that back. Most people translate this as, the scoundrel says internally, quote, there is no God, unquote. And then it continues with, let us not, uh, everyone acts corruptly. They all perform lonesome deeds. There's no one who does good. As if that's the Psalter now beginning to speak. But instead, what I've chosen to do is see all of verse 1, as the scoundrel. I'll pause. The word naval, which I translate as scoundrel, can be translated as fool, benighted. Those are the two main translations. But scoundrel seems better than fool or benighted. And this 
one way to understand this, which I, I left aside as a translation, is as follows. I'll point it out and then I'll stay back in the flow. The scoundrel who some can understand as the leader. So the scoundrel is a leader who says internally, says in his heart, there is no God, unquote. And as a result, the people act corruptly. The people perform lonesome deeds. There is no one who does good. So that's one way to understand verse one. When there is a leader who's a scoundrel, then the people act without moral authority. But the way I chose to put in the quotation marks, which of course don't exist in Hebrew, is this is what the scoundrel says. There is no God and therefore let us act corruptly. Let us perform lonesome deeds. There is no one who does good. And then here's the second part of the psalm, and that's verses 2 to 6. And verses 2 to 6, that's part B. That's, if you will, the response. And that could be, in many cases, the Psalter. But here I tend to read this, 2 to 6, as God's response. And then we'll come to the final verse, which is often the case, somewhat disjointed with what comes before. So here's how I read it. The scoundrel says, there is no God. Let us act corruptly. Let us perform lonesome deeds. There's no one who does good. And a wordplay. There is no one who does good. Ain oset tov. That will be repeated in verse 3. We'll come back to that, but that's a key motif. Ain o setov, nobody who does good. But the nobody who does good here in verse one is a double entendre. It could refer both to God and to people, or both. I tend to think in a poetic way, it's the scoundrel saying, there's no one who does good. There is no authority, no people, no God, as a punchline, as an emphasis that you're on your own. And then verse two, Adonai from heaven scopes out humanity. And again, there's many different words. I translate scopes, but it can be looks, sees. And there's a sense of God is above looking down. And God wants to see, is there any understanding after God? They're all astray, altogether foul. And then that repeating of that line, Ain o setov, there is no one who does good. None, not even one, that added emphasis. And then the exclamation, do they not understand anything? Evildoers who would eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on Adonai. I love this metaphor of eating up people like bread. What I love about it is, the sense that the evildoers are only really concerned with their stomach, with objects, with what's self-satisfying. And that's how they view other people as objects for their gut, for their self-satisfaction. I think that's a very powerful image of somebody who is unaccountable, who's self-centered, who's only concerned about their own pleasures. And then five, there they will be terribly terrified, for God is with that righteous generation. Verse 6, you may put to shame the counsel of the poor, but Adonai is a refuge. And so an important comment of a common thread, and we saw this yesterday, and we've seen it repeatedly, and that is the emphasis on God's concern for the weak and the poor. That's the religious nature of Psalms, that God's sensitivity, as we saw yesterday in Psalm 13, the Psalter was concerned about the haughtiness of his neighbors and their misuse of language. But what God most cares about is how the poor are treated. A Protestant theologian of the 20th century, Walter Brugman, writes as follows. The ultimate mark of God's rule is not ontological principle, 
but the social certitude of the Lord's solidarity with the poor. And the context here is a moral society, which is what this Psalter is addressing, sees itself accountable to God, to a source of authority for how it treats the weakest in its midst. If God is the parent of all peoples, God is concerned about the suffering weak. And throughout the Bible, and we'll see that in this week's Parsha of Kiddoshim, where it says, you shall be holy, you shall see the world through God's eyes, is concerned for the weak. And that's verse 6. And now the closing verse, verse 7. That's by Robert Alter, kind of standard language, but I see it as more than standard language. This is now the Psalter, and here's the shift. The shift is, for the first time, rather than being universal description of God's view of humanity, specifically a reference to the land of Israel and the people of Israel. Oh, that the deliverance of Israel would come from Zion when Adonai restores the nation, the nation's tranquility. Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. Some people translate the word shvut as fortunes. I, at the last moment, chose to translate it as tranquility. Its root is shav, to sit. Shvut is also a word used in rabbinic Hebrew for Shabbat and how one is not supposed to be active but in place on Shabbat. So what the Psalter is saying here at this last line as I read it is, you know Adonai, and here Adonai is the word used, may you demonstrate for all those naysayers your presence by redeeming us, delivering us, welcoming us back to Zion. The classic commentators, they see this as a prophetic psalm of King David anticipating exile. Contemporary scholars of the Bible see this as a psalm written in exile because of the closing line. Classic commentators would see this psalm as addressing a specific scoundrel, like Rashi, would say this refers to Nebuchadnezzar, who exiled the Jews from Babel, to Babylonia, and that's who is being addressed. Um, not necessarily for monsters, would see this as a universal condemnation of immorality from God's perspective, a lack of sensitivity to a watching eye who cares about how the weak are treated, with the Psalter imagining how God at, in heaven looks down with disappointment, and the Psalter with verse 7 saying, God, show them they're wrong. So there's a word of hope at the end, not of declaration, faith in that the hope embodies faith, but an acknowledgement that the situation remains broken. So therefore, God, come to those who deny you and reveal your presence by our ingathering. With that, as an analysis of this psalm, there is, of course, so much more to be said about it word by word, but I found this psalm to be exciting in terms of this imaginative mood, imaginative mood, mood and move of seeing the world from God's perspective. And now I ask to have all the screens so we can see each other for a few minutes of reacting as to questions or one thought in terms of how this psalm grabbed you. They would eat up my people like bread. Um, anybody have a... Rabbi? Yes, who's Alex? Omar Nevel Belibo. Does yeah. that imply that the, the 
uh, Naval would be pretending to still be uh, believing and still be conducting the, the rites and the rituals, but speaking only into his own heart. That's a great insight, Shelby. I mean, Shelby, yeah. Alex. Uh, so Shelby on the screen. Yeah. Great comment, Alex. In, in, let's look at what Alex is putting our attention on. It's verse four. The scoundrel says internally, back to um, choices of translation, as Alex notes, literally it's the Naval says in his heart, but I have chosen to avoid the genders of people, so I do it says internally, because that's what it means to say it in the heart. Please remove the text from the, there you go, it says internally. And yes, in that sense, Alex, this Naval, this scoundrel, because we've seen this as a reoccurring theme, we don't know, we, you know, start, one way to understand it is the evil person starts with an internal thought, which is, I am unaccountable. And that's the starting place for the evil that then unfolds. But the other possibilities, as we saw so beautifully in the psalm yesterday with Belev Libam, you know, with this double heart, is that there is hypocrisy. So, and that also is possible, that it's internal in terms of the hypocrisy of the actual deeds. Uh, any other, other reactions to this song? Hi, Hi. can you hear me? Hal? Yes, Hal. Thank you, Hal. Go ahead. Uh, as we're reading these uh, psalms, uh, I became more and more identified with the psalmist and its complexity as a, hum as a being. Yesterday, the first stanzas about yearning, 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 and then yes. the fourth um, verse, he, he says, stop and answer me, as always being angry at God for uh, not listening to him. And then uh, just the complex being of the psalmist I could identify with uh, as a, a real person, almost, uh, as I am, complicated and looking and being angry at the same time. Finally, to say the last stanza uh, here today about uh, people ha having bread, bread, and so that uh, so pertinent to what's going on in our lives now. There's so many people going hungry. Okay. So a few thoughts, Hal. Thank you for those comments. The first is, I too am falling in love with the Psalms by virtue of their subtlety that I never appreciated as before I started reading them closely, as we're doing now. And the complexity of the Psalter and the pain of the Psalter, who is a person with mixed emotions, hoping, yearning, of faith, and yet doubting, because the situation is painful. This one, in contrast to yesterday, I loved, because as I read it, here the Psalter is saying, I am identified with God. This is how I imagine God is in pain, looking down from heaven. God is seeing things that pain God. And that quality of empathy and identification by virtue of a relationship with God as a moral being deeply moves me. And the piece that, again, I circle is the emphasis on moral being that is central to the Psalter, which is what makes this religion at its best the care for the weak and the poor. And the last comment in terms of how, when I read these Psalms, no doubt I'm reading it in the moment we're in, in terms of leaders that I'm often feeling troubled by, in terms of speaking with a quality of care and empathy for the poor, and the sense of selfishness, that you know, eating people like bread, meaning treating people as, objects of their pleasure. That for me is just a, a riveting kind of image. And again, it's the image of the Psalter imagining how God is experiencing the world. And that shift is what makes this Psalm distinctive, the shift toward this empathy for God. One closing 
a comment and then I'll pull it together. Does anybody else have something that's resonated for you? So, um, let Rabbi, me point. Ed, Ed Sussman does. Oh, good. I love hearing from Ed. I didn't see that. I didn't have all the people on front of my screen. Ed, I, yeah, I, was, I want to hear your voice. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? I can. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, I, and see if I can bring my train of thought back. I, I was interested in the fact that they, in the first couple of lines where it, you have to convince people if there is no God, it's okay to do loathsome deeds. And yeah. my, my theory on this sometimes is that maybe it's the, the idea that we take for granted if somebody is observant or religious in beliefs that they will, uh, and they believe in God, that they won't do, uh, you know, uh, they won't become a scoundrel or do evil deeds. Yet we see this with politicians, we see this with corruption a lot of times, and yet we, we really can't make a, a value judgment based on the fact that if you believe in God, that you won't do something evil. So I wanna just emphasize that, Ed, in terms of it, it, it tags and reinforces both Hal and Alex's comment in terms of when people say internally may not be how they really act. If people genuinely in their hearts, this Psalter seems to indicate, believe that they are accountable before a seeing God who cares about morality, that will influence how they act. All too often, and we do see this hypocrisy of people acting quote unquote, ritually, religiously, politically, and doing so without a sense of their own genuine accountability. Correct. And so that's the disconnect between the truly righteous. Correct. I've been counting, this is my last closing comment, what is the middle word or the middle verse to reveal to me where is the psalm going? Because I often see the psalms as a kind of a mountain or a natural climb up and climb down. I'll point out the middle verse in this psalm is the first line of verse four. Hello, yadu kol palai aven. Do they, the evildoers, not understand anything? And that seems to be at the core of God's disruption. Don't they understand anything? And the flip side is the core of what one has to understand, which is everything, is that there is a God to whom morality matters. Or as Heschel said, if God is not everything, God is nothing. And the everything here is that morality matters to God, which is why God with verse six says, you may put the poor, so now to the evildoers, but Adonai is a refuge. So with that, we're right up at 10.30. I am so delighted to have you with me again. I um, want to remind you that tomorrow, that tonight, I'm doing an interview with Janine Bernstein at 7.30. She wrote, she's a UCI radio personality on the FM 89.9. She's a congregant who wrote a book, Getting Out the Funk. She'll be talking tonight with me at 7.30 about self-care and um, getting through COVID. I look forward to perhaps sharing that with you. Thank you again. This half hour puts wind in my sails for the whole day. Thank you.